Hey everybody, this is Yuri from Sure. My awesome colleague Paul is creating a whole series of videos on wireless systems and antenna distribution and all of these really, really cool practical things to help you get the best out of your wireless setup. This allows me to nerd out and talk about the things that I love, specifically the how and the why we do these things in wireless in the first place. So for this, how do you do that? Let's nerd out together and talk about electromagnetic waves. Today, we're gonna to talk about how electromagnetic waves are made, their characteristics and properties, and then how we can take advantage of this knowledge to make it useful for us in wireless. So let's start with this thing, which has some kind of electric charge. Doesn't matter if it's a proton or electron or whatever. We'll just call it Charlie. Charlie, the charged electric thing. All right, so Charlie's gonna have an electric field, an area of influence around it that will pull in or push away other things that are charged. If Charlie is moving at a constant speed in the same direction, Charlie will also have a magnetic field that is associated with it. If Charlie accelerates, so if Charlie changes speed or it changes direction, then it will cause a change in the electric field, which will then induce a change in the magnetic field. But then that change in the magnetic field will induce a change in the electric field. And then that change in the electric field will induce a change in the magnetic field. And this pairing of changing fields over and over again will repeat indefinitely, and it will piece out away from Charlie in what we call an electromagnetic wave. But wait a minute, I learned a long time ago in science class that molecules and stuff are always moving and vibrating and changing and whatever. Doesn't that mean that everything all the time is creating electromagnetic waves? Yes, even you, meatbag. That's why we have technology that can see you in the middle of the night and why we have thermometers that can tell your temperature without ever touching you. The way in which these electromagnetic waves are generated determines how quickly this change in fields happens per second, which we call frequency. Generally, the higher the frequency, the more energy the wave has. We can also refer to them in terms of wavelength, which is the distance that wave travels as it completes one of these changes in fields. The higher the frequency, the shorter the wavelength. So let's look at all the possible frequencies that we know. The lowest frequency, longest wavelength, and lowest energy waves are called radio waves, and they're made by accelerating things that are charged through conductors that we call antennas. This is what we will focus on since they are the waves that we use for everything wireless, including Sure products, TV broadcasts, and cell phones. Some wireless products like GLXD go up a little bit higher into the microwave area, which are the same waves that we use in Wi-Fi. The waves made by molecules wiggling around at room temperature fall into the infrared range. That's the stuff that you and I make just by existing. We can't see infrared, but sometimes we can feel it as heat. Visible light, the stuff that we can actually see, is usually made by either something getting really, really hot or by electrons rearranging themselves within the atoms and molecules. Pretty cool stuff. Waves that have slightly higher frequencies than what we can see, we put into the ultraviolet range, and at the higher end, these have enough energy to penetrate our skin. So, you know, we're sunscreen people. The really, really high frequency, high energy stuff are X-rays and gamma rays, and these things can really, really hurt you. And trust me, I speak from experience here. Now that we know how these waves are made, let's talk about their characteristics so we can put them to use and talk about why we do certain things with our wireless systems. First, electromagnetic waves can interact with their environment, and depending on their wavelength, they might be absorbed or reflected by obstacles and barriers that are in their path. As an example, a typical wavelength for an SLXD system in the J-band might be only about 50 centimeters or 20 inches. So in general, to avoid these interactions, you want to keep a line of sight between the antenna that transmits the wave and the antenna that receives it. Since the waves that we use in wireless are radio waves and are electromagnetic waves that are produced by conducting antennas, they also love to interact with any other conductors that might be in their path. So putting any metal in the way of a radio wave could potentially be bad news. In addition, we humans are mostly salt water, so we're also pretty good conductors of electricity ourselves. Unlike a light bulb, which scatters lights everywhere in every possible direction, the waves that are made by antennas are polarized, which means that they tend to have a specific orientation in relation to the Earth. So, for the best possible signal, you should position your receiving antenna in the same orientation as the transmitting antenna. Here's a chart that shows you how much signal you can lose if the antennas are not oriented correctly. This is also why in Paul's video, he recommends putting two antennas in this V shape that you see here, to maximize pickup when the transmitter is constantly changing orientation. 
finally, waves can interfere with each other. This can be something as simple as a wave interfering with its own reflection, or multiple waves that are close in frequency and close to each other in physical space that will interfere with each other. So let's take everything we've discussed and put it to practice. Here's the setup that I worked on not too long ago. There are three wireless receivers about 50 feet away from the stage. Problem one is that the antennas are in the back of the rack, so there is no sight line from the transmitter antennas to the receiver antennas. Similarly, the waves have to go through or around this metal rack, which can cause unwanted interactions with the waves. This rack is also low to the ground, which means that the waves have to travel through all of the people that are standing in the space. And finally, there is no antenna distribution, which means there are six receiver antennas all in close proximity to each other, which increases the likelihood of interference and some other problems. To solve these issues, we added an antenna distribution system to reduce the likelihood of interference, and we placed the remaining two receiving antennas in the front of the rack and in a higher position. This ensures that we have a sightline without people or the rack itself getting in the way. And there you have it. Thanks for nerding out with me today. If you have any other questions, please leave them in the comments, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>